It is the opening salvo from our classic album of the day today, The Damned, from the album Machine Gun Etiquette. That was Love Song, Captain Sensible joins us. Was that always going to be the opening track to the records? Can you remember? Because it does work fantastically well at the start of the album. Yeah, and the, the thing about that lineup was what had changed was we now got Algie on bass, mm. and he was a phenomenon. He used to use 10 P pieces. What, the plectrums? Yeah. Really? To, to get that thunderous noise, uh, the, oh. the intros are to love songs. I'll talk to you about the band in a second. Actually, before I forget, though, what on earth are you doing on the sleeve of the record? Because it looks like you're in New York, and it looks like you're lost. Uh, yeah, they, um, decided to have us walk around New York. And what are you wearing? I was wearing my, uh, they called it my Carpy costume, which there was a load of people saying, oh, look, it's Big Bird and all that sort of <laughs> stuff. And, uh, I didn't know, I'd never seen the Muppets, so I didn't know who Big Bird was. Right. Did you wear that mohair top the whole time? Did you wear it all through 1979? Pretty much, yeah. yeah good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it did get extremely hot I imagine. under the stage lights, yeah. so I got a reputation for being a, a nudist, you know, but it was a, uh, in my defence, it was just very, very hot, and once you overheat, you just have to whip your clothes off. Before we get to Machine Gun Etiquette, we should talk about the run-up to it. You'd already made two albums, and you'd been the first to everything for a while, first punk single, first punk album, Damn Damn Downed, uh, which must have been, uh, I imagine, a very exciting, but also a very chaotic point in your life, was it? You know, I've been in, uh, I was in Johnny Moped yeah. before that, and, you know, we did about two gigs a year, and from that we went, I went to the Damned, and it was like, you know, every night. Yeah. yeah and if you weren't gigging, you were, you were ligging, you know, and, uh, I went to, you know, I, I virtually lived at the Marquee Club, and it was, um, in fact, Berry, Berwick Street Market, we used to push the market barrows out of the way, and it was like, uh, our own personal parking space, <laughs> we come up from Croydon. <laughs> I mean, I knew the people on the door, and uh, we never paid, and it was just a complete lifestyle. Yeah, every, every day was a holiday, basically. Yeah. It was just a very mad time. So much so that I can't remember an awful lot about it, because I you think did, I was probably having a good time, but... You did go, you went to America as well. You were one of the first, if not the first, UK punk band to go to the States, and I read somewhere that you had a collection box at the gigs because you'd run out of money and couldn't get home unless, unless somebody gave you some cash for a return plane ticket. Yeah, what had actually happened was, once the some of the promoters had found out how much of a real punk group we were, and we didn't give a damn, basically, about the performances or our behaviour, or you know, a seriously debauched punk act. Mm. And it's not everyone's cup of tea uh, to have a band like sort of wrecking your stage. I mean, we smashed all the mirrors at uh, one club in New York. This was a, the days where they put you on at some disco gig, you know, with, with mirrors and tinsel behind the stage. And I, I thought to myself, God, that's a real affront. I mean, how dare they put us on a, a docile like this? So you, you just, I, I went round with the, uh, with the bass guitar and I smashed every mirror at the back of the stage. And that news got to the West Coast and they cancelled a lot of our gigs. So, right. um, we ended up with a, uh, if you want to see the back of the dams, you know, please <laughs> contribute to this. Uh, Send us home. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it was quite well subscribed, actually. <laughs> And that was also, I remember we had, uh, you know, because it was a new phenomenon punk at the time, mm. and there was all sorts of people on the guest list, Rod Stewart, I believe, was on, and uh, all sorts of famous names, we crossed them off and made them pay. <laughs> <laughs> You made the Music for Pleasure after that, which was a record which, in some cases, was beginning to realise what you wanted to do as a band. In, in some ways it worked, and in some ways it didn't work. And also, it sort of led to the splits in the band. Is that fair? Yeah, much as I love and respect Brian, all those marvellous songs... I mean, I joined the dam when I heard uh, New Rose, I thought, crikey! He's a visionary, and he, he would give us these pep talks. There's something come in, you know, it's going to like sort of really shake music to its foundations. And he knew that. I mean, nobody else that I'd ever met had like, and he was right. So Brian has obviously been a, a catalyst in this, but you get to the second album. Brian wrote all these phenomenal songs, and then for the second album, he knocked up a bunch of tunes in a week, and they just, for me, they didn't have the spark of the first album. He'd moved on on a bit, but it wasn't the direction which I was keen on going in. So there was a bit of dissent, and also he wasn't listening to our ideas. But for some reason or other, I started kind of deciding uh, maybe I could write tunes myself. So, and I'm a melody buff. 
Yeah. That had to wait until Machine Connecticut before I did anything. Two things I would probably say or predict about you, noise and melody pretty much go hand in hand. Yeah. yeah that's it's it. a nice mixture. Yeah. I think you split somewhere around March 78, but by the end of the year, having gone away and formed different bands, because Rat had left and formed a band, and I think you were in another band, finally by the end of the year, either by playing gigs together or bumping into each other, the dam reunites in some way. Do you remember how you came up? Because you, you did a couple of gigs as the Doomed, didn't you, I think? Yeah. The amazing thing was we were all... Uh, the Dan were considered to be uh, consigned to the dustbin of rock and roll uh, after our glorious leader had departed, Brian. I mean, who was a genius, mm. let's face it. And the amazing thing was we all discovered we could write a tune. So what did you, what did you do? Just end up in a rehearsal room and say, right, I've got a couple of songs. Somebody else brings a couple of songs along and you just start from scratch. Yeah, we, we used to, we basically lived in this studio in Croydon near the Crystal Palace football ground called uh, RMS. I mean, whenever we weren't gigging, we were just in the studio and, um, I mean, we'd do our songs, we'd do our demos and everything and if, We'd run out of tunes. We'd attempt to do like the Walker Brothers, The Sun Ain't Gonna Shine Anymore, or something like that. Mm. You know, and I learned so much by deconstructing their songs and then putting them back together again with all the harmonies and the, and, it, and layering. Um, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a great learning period. Was it a surprise to you that um, Chiswick came on board and was so uh, behind you, given that, you know, I'm sure at the time, probably The Damned had a reputation, as you say, for being slightly uncontrollable volatile i think is one of the <laughs> words that are in the sleeve notes to the reissue of this record um and yeah, i think people had sort of got i can't deal with them anymore mm -hmm. they're unmanageable the thing was record companies in those days uh, it was such a golden period really the 70s you could go in the studio and do exactly what you wanted and you could make the craziest stupidest most brilliant music you could possibly come up with and that this is why the 70s is littered with albums of absolute genius and like complete nonsense you know anything goes they would pay the bills and occasionally they would pop their heads in and, and see what you're up to and occasionally we had a visit from the a and r guy and we would usually usually know that they were on their way so we'd set up some crazy scenario where the band were kind of uh, having a punch up on the floor or <laughs> or the drummer was banging the strings of the grand piano <laughs> Uh, say no, that's really good. That is, I'll tell you what. No, no, you've ruined my song. Hold on a minute, you know. And uh, the record company goes in. Oh my God! I just see my, I just seen hundred grand go down the toilet. <laughs> uh, you made the you made the record though with wasn't uh, Roger Armstrong from Chiswick involved in making the record, helping to produce the record? The he record. Uh, he was yes, yeah. he was there quite a lot of the time. Did they put you in a nice studio to actually record the album? We did it at Wessex, which oh, uh, is Highbury Islington. Yeah. It was a, a church, but it, it was a, it was an amazing studio because uh, we had The Clash next door doing, I think, Sandinista or, or London Calling, one of those. Oh, really? With Guy Stevens producing. Guy Stevens, right. I, I think, did something with the, uh, the Stones. Yeah. And he was, he was a great producer, but he was, like, completely out to lunch. He would be completely sozzled when he came to the studio about midday and he would drag the taxi driver in with him and say, you ain't going nowhere, you know, um, you're on a retainer for the rest of the day and, uh, and he, all his job was to do basically was go down and get another bottle of whiskey occasionally. Really? And, uh, <laughs> and the Clash would be up to like sort of take 47 on some, <laughs> some song or other and he got, turned around to me, Guy Stevens, he said, he said, Bloody hell, Captain, they've got it at last, at last they've got it, I've got to tell them. And he pushed the talkback button down, he said, Guys, you've got it, you've got it, you've, you've nailed this one, you know? And they all like sort of threw their headphones off, you know, and said, Oh, you've... So, so and so, you deafened us, so that was the end of that take. So it was like, take 48. <laughs> <laughs> Let's play a track from the uh, record and we'll pick up uh, with uh, the recording of our classic album of the day, Machine Gun Etiquette, after this. And uh, more from the captain as well, following this track, which is called Melody Lee from our classic album of the day machine gun etiquette that was the track i think which swung it for me because the first time i heard the album i hired it out from one of those cassette libraries remember you could hire right. cassettes yeah. uh so i went on the back of that and i think uh plan nine channel seven because the two singles you'd had a couple of hits off the record first and your love song had gone top 20 which as you say mm. with the damn dead and buried was an, an astonishing success and then smash it up off the back of that uh, but i think it was melody lee because melody lee actually 
gave you that confirmation that this was the damned changing their sound, exploring their sounds, and you know, the, the, there were no more boundaries really. This was going to be a very interesting record. Yeah, uh, because previous to this record, um, we'd wanted to have Sid Barrett produce Music for Pleasure. Right. Pink Floyd gave us their studio, Britannia Row, because I think they were embarrassed that they didn't pick Sid up that day, you know, and uh, right. he wasn't in the band anymore. And they wanted him to get back into uh, music business again. Yeah. And uh, we were sitting in the studio in Britannia Row and we heard the door buzzer go and oh, crikey, it's Sid, Sid Barrett, you know. Oh, I couldn't believe it. And I were all like sort of, oh, 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 oh crikey, here he comes. And uh, there was clip clock clip clock down the corridor the door opened and it was uh, nick mason <laughs> the drummer of pink floyd he said i'm sorry sid he's just not up to do this one and they sent me instead is that okay <laughs> 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 which you know and he and he did his best to produce us and uh, he did his best to make us sound like pink floyd and uh it wasn't really what, what was required yeah. uh, we needed we needed loads of psychedelia and like sort of you know cosmic lunacy we, but our idea was to mix psychedelia and punk and we had to wait until machine gun Et etiquette before we actually did that mm. formula i mean it's still i mean machine gun etiquette is quite a schizophrenic record though isn't it i mean it brilliantly so in a way but there's the celebration of love song and noise 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 but there's also just can't be happy which ended up being a single but again a different tangent for the damned and quite darker and it's where yeah. dave really comes into his own as a vocalist as well yeah the story behind that song is when you go to a studio, there's often paraphernalia hanging around from previous sessions. Mm. I said to, um, said to the engineer, who have you had in here previous to us recently? You know, he said, oh, well, the last act in here was, uh, Des O'Connor. <laughs> and, uh, and he proceeded to tell us, well, Des used to go in a vocal booth over there. He used to turn all the lights out and like, so that nobody could see him. And he'd just like sort of go in there with a bottle of brandy and everything. And he said that's the way it worked for him. Yeah. And, you know, Vania, of course, was listening. And of course, he, <laughs> he copied that one. And uh, the other thing that was lying around, I said, what's that over in the corner? He said, oh, that's, um, 10 cc's mellotron which they tampered with when they put their own vocal um tapes into it so I thought, oh I'll turn it on let's have a listen to that then and, I was, uh, uh, and we used it on uh, i just can't be happy and that's all the voices the the, the weird mm. ghostly voices in the background are the same ones that 10 cc used on i'm not in love <laughs> uh if you can believe that it was real 1984 stuff really as well that particular track but there's a lot of being pushed around and uh, a lot of sort of self-defense mechanism in that in the lyrics of this record in places i think it sort of gives you the idea that even right from the very start the damn considered themselves to be outsiders really we uh, we never played the game mm. and whether we've had a fair crack at a whip i don't know i mean uh, every it's su success for me is not having to go back to work and i've I managed to avoid that since 1976. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just uh, a couple of other tracks I wanted to mention. Just going back, though, to this image. So, in my head, you're at Wessex Studios. So, is there a canteen at Wessex? Do you sit down with a clash in one corner and a couple of members of the Damned in the other? The ghosts of Rick Wakeman in the hovering uh, over over you? There was a kitchen there. I wasn't manned by any. You just go in there and make a cup of tea or something. Right. And uh, it's just uh, there was a bunch of bevy that Guy Stevens had uh, contributed. Uh, but uh, mostly the, from the damn uh, uh, studio, there was like whoops and hollers of like, so, way, come on, open another can, you know, and, uh, Oi, well, that's my bottle of whiskey. You. And, uh, from the clash down the corridor, there was just this waft, this pungent waft of, uh, <laughs> Se whatever, serious endeavor, <laughs> whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, on Machine Gun Etiquette, I mean, as I say, it's quite schizophrenic in a way. Did you, I don't suppose for a second you actually stopped and thought about it, but did you, did it ever occur to you that, you know, you were doing something quite radically different in a way for what the Damned were doing and what was going on at the time? Because this was going to be a record which was quite removed, obviously, from the first album, not so much from the second, but this was an album which probably would surprise one or two people. Well, um, I just don't think we cared. Mm. And uh, we didn't care about sales, we didn't care about reviews or anything like that. But because for me and Dave, and well, and, and the rest of them, I mean, our generation, we, we, we came up on um, Sergeant Pepper and Tommy and, you know, uh, Pet Sounds, albums that really pushed the boundaries. And 
every track was abs absolutely cracking, you know, mm. uh, there was no fillers. And we, I've always judged Damn Records on that as being, I wanted them to be as good as they could possibly be, uh, with pushing the boundaries totally. Uh, so that's where that came from, really. And that uh, leads you to the end of the record with Smash It Up, because, I mean, just the idea of a band like yourselves doing a record which has a part one and a part two, previously, uh, you know, the sort of, uh, the natural recourse, studio recourse to action of the prog rockers and the hippies. Part one and part two? Yeah. The, I mean, well, the, well the, the Damned is uh, full of these amazing coincidences, and the thing that happened there was we, we had this song called Smash It Up, and we'd been out on tour with Mark Bolan and T-Rex and one day I was sitting in, I was, I was living with my mum and dad in Croydon and I was sitting out on this sunny afternoon in the deck chair, we had a deck chair in the back garden and my mum come back from the shops and she said, Hey Ray, your mate, what's his name, that bloke, uh, that, that pop star you went out on tour with, he's dead, he's dead. He's, I said, who's that? Who? Who? She said, Rowley or Bowley or what? I can't remember his name. Uh, I said, not Bolan. She said, that's it. Uh, I ran round the corner to the shops and um, I bought an evening standard because there was no rolling news radio stations or anything like that in those days, no internet. I bought an evening standard and there it was, you know, Mark Bolan had died in a car crash. And I come home absolutely devastated because he'd been so good to us. And for for a rock star, he was surprisingly humble, a re really decent bloke. And I, I went into my room and I sat down and after a quick blub, um, I wrote this little piece of music, um, which became Smash It Up Part One. And the incredible thing was, I didn't even put it together that he died in a car smash. And to, to have linked that bit onto, you know, this is, I didn't add up to, but now people think, you know, I'll smash it up, you know, it marked the piece, the dedication to Mark Bolan at the front. But it was never intended like that. It was just that I, I express myself best in music and I was really upset. And that's how that piece came up. It's more touching now than uh, when I first heard it, I think, that record. Um, Machine Gun Etiquette's been a classic album. It's not the track we're going to play. Uh, this featuring uh, an amazing, slightly demented solo. Well, there's a couple, actually. But if anything, sort of uh, actually gives you the confirmation that this was a more expressive version of The Damned. It's Plan 9, Channel 7. Do you remember recording this? Yeah. Dave was coming up with all these ideas, and he would kind of hum a lot of the ideas in, into my ear, and I'd, I would try to, you know play them on the keyboard and stuff for him and um i remember we we had this because we were in love with garage music and so we bought a vox continental uh and, it, and we were just like playing da 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 and stuff like that you know just for fun but um we, one day we decided to plug it into a mxr um phase pedal which uh, was mainly to be used for guitars, but um, it made this incredible kind of, um, you know, drifty kind of psychedelic melancholy sound, which uh, is the backwash to the whole of Plan 9. Mm. And as soon as we heard that, the song just flowed, really. Brilliant. It sounds like this. Captain, thank you so much for coming in. It's lovely seeing you again. This from uh, Machine Gun Etiquette is The Damned. It's Plan 9, Channel 7. <laughs> performances or our behavior or you know a seriously debauched punk act mm. and it's not everyone's cup of tea uh, to have a band like sort of wrecking your stage i mean we smashed all the mirrors uh one club in new york this was a, the days where they put you on at some disco gig you know with, with mirrors and tinsel behind the stage and i, I thought to myself God, that's a real affront. I mean, how dare they put us on a, a docile like this? So you, you just, I, I went round with the, uh, with the bass guitar and I smashed every mirror at the back of the stage. And that news got to the West Coast and they cancelled a lot of our gigs. So, right. um, we ended up with a, if you want to see the back of the dams, you know. It is the opening salvo from our classic album of the day today, The Damned, from the album Machine Gun Etiquette. That was Love Song, Captain Sensible joins us. Was that always going to be the opening track to the records? Can you remember? Because it does work fantastically well at the start of the album. Yeah, and the, the thing about that lineup was what had changed was we now got Algy on bass, mm. and he was a phenomenon. He used to use 10p pieces. 
What to, plectrums? Yeah. To, really? To get that thunderous noise, uh, the, the oh. intros are to love songs. We'll talk to you about the band in a second. Actually, before I forget though, what on earth are you doing on the sleeve of the record? Because it looks like you're in New York and it looks like you're lost. Uh, yeah, they from Croydon. <laughs> I mean, I knew the people on the door and, uh, we never paid and, it was just a complete lifestyle, yeah. Every, every day was a holiday, basically. Yeah. It was just a very mad time. So much so that I can't remember an awful lot about it, because I you think did, I was probably having a good time, but... You did go, you went to America as well. You were one of the first, if not the first, UK punk band to go to the States. And I read somewhere that you had a collection box at the gigs because you'd run out of money and couldn't get home unless, unless somebody gave you some cash for a return plane ticket. Yeah, what had actually happened was, once the some of the promoters had found out how much of a real punk group we were, and we didn't give a damn, basically, about the... We um, decided to have us walk around New York. And what are you wearing? I was wearing my, uh, oh, they called it my carpy costume, which there was a load of people saying, oh, look, it's Big Bird, and all that sort of <laughs> stuff, and uh, I didn't know, I'd never seen the Muppets, so I didn't know who Big Bird was. Right. Did you wear that mohair top the whole time? Did you wear it all through 1979? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it did get extremely hot under the stage lights, yeah. so I got a reputation for being a, a nudist, you know, but it was, a uh, in my defence, it was just very, very hot, and once you overheat, you just have to whip your clothes off. Before we get to Machine Gun Etiquette, we should talk about the run-up to it. You'd already made two albums, and you'd been the first to everything for a while, first punk single, first punk album, Damn Damn Down, uh, which must have been, uh, I imagine, a very exciting, but also a very chaotic point in your life, was it? You know, I've been in, I uh, was in Johnny Moped yeah. before that, and, you know, we did about two gigs a year, and from that we went, I went to the Damned, and it was like, you know, every night. Yeah. yeah. And if you weren't gigging, you were, you were ligging, you know, and, uh, I went to, you know, I, I virtually lived at the Marquee Club, and it was, um, in fact, Berry, Berwick Street Market, we used to push the market barrows out of the way, and it was like, uh, our own personal parking space. <laughs> we come up.